Good afternoon. I'm just so pleased uh, we're continuing our candidates forum. And uh, again, if you could just give a great DAV welcome and round of applause to Senator Tammy Baldwin. Well, you know how it is with old guys. You got to go. You got to go. Sorry. <laughs> Tammy Baldwin has a long and distinguished career of public service and was elected to the U.S. Senate in Wisconsin in 2012. Lights on. Thank you, Tom. I don't know how we could do this without you. <laughs> okay, Senator Baldwin was born in the Badger State and raised by her maternal grandparents in Madison, Wisconsin. As her grandmother grew older, Tammy served as her primary caregiver, a challenging but deeply rewarding experience. In the Senate, Tammy worked across party lines to pass bipartisan legislation <clears throat> into law to support family caregivers across America. Currently, Senator Baldwin is, uh, is leading the fight to protect people with pre-existing conditions, lower prescription drug prices, and make health care affordable for all Wisconsinites. Senator Baldwin has also worked across party lines to improve veterans' health care and to combat the opioid epidemic. Most notably, Senator Baldwin worked with many veterans groups, including DAV, health care professionals, and the family of a fallen veteran to introduce and then pass Jason's Law, a bipartisan bill that is working to ensure ill and injured veterans have personalized care and safe alternatives from, for pain management. As a member of the Senate Appropriations Committee, she has consistently fought for stronger investments in veterans programs and to expand the veterans caregiver program. In the interest of full disclosure, Senator Baldwin was given an award by DAV for her work on veterans legislation last year. If reelected, we look forward again to working with Senator Baldwin to ensure the promises made to the men and women who served are kept. It is with great pleasure I introduce Senator Tammy Baldwin for her opening remarks. Let's give her a warm DAV welcome. All right, we're gonna to try to get the sound systems working well. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Um, well, first I want to thank everyone here for your service to this nation. I am uh, really delighted to get a chance to join uh, this DAV conference and particularly while better late than never to be a part of the candidate forum that you've hosted today. Um, I am very proud of the work we have done together, particularly the work we have done to pass what we now just call Jason's Law. Um, it was an amazing 
opportunity to work with uh, the Simkuski family, uh, to work with the DAV and other veteran ser service organizations, to put together legislation that took on a problem that was at the VA. And we worked on a solution that holds the VA accountable, strengthens oversight of their prescribing practices, and provides safer care for our veterans to prevent a tragedy like Jason's loss from happening again. Jason's law is working. It strengthened the VA's opioid safety initiative and in Wisconsin, uh, the bipartisan reform has helped the Toma VA achieve, and get this, a 47% decrease in the number of veterans who are on chronic opioids. And for veterans who are on both opioids and benzodiazepines, there has been a 76% reduction. Yes. Um, and I want to say that these sort of numbers are reflected nationwide throughout the VA. And, um, and I just uh, want to um, thank you again for working with me, but to point out, because they've just walked into the room, two people who are extraordinarily um, responsible for uh, turning their personal tragedies into hope, and that's Marvin Linda Simkowski, Jason's parents. Um, I also just want to add a little bit more on this topic, um, but I know I'm supposed to be giving a brief opening statement, is that um, the point is not to ignore the real pain that uh, veterans may experience, either visible or invisible, but to provide as many alternatives as possible to make sure that um, veterans can get safe care to deal with uh, these real issues. Um, I also want to thank you for the work that we did together to pass a number of key measures from my Air Carrier Access Amendments Act. I know that's a mouthful, but we just passed the FAA, the Federal Aviation um, Reauthorization Act of 2018. And this, uh, these provisions protect the rights of disabled airplane passengers and close service gaps that veterans with disabilities frequent encount frequently encounter with air travel. And as you heard, I'm a member of the Senate Appropriations Committee, and particularly its VA subcommittee, and I've consistently fought for stronger investments in veterans' programs to expand the veterans' caregiver program. And I also want to uh, recognize what you just mentioned in the introduction, um, how incredibly honored I uh, was to be um, awarded uh, the Outstanding Senator, Senate Legislator of the Year Award from the DAV. I am deeply appreciative and grateful. So I look forward to our conversation today about how we continue to strengthen and expand care and opportunities for veterans in Wisconsin. And thank you again for all you do and your service to this country. recently passed legislation regarding the Department of Veterans Affairs for the upcoming fiscal year 2019 and advanced funding for 2020. While the funding level will meet most all of the VA and veterans' current needs, medical care funding is likely short $1.6 billion for fiscal year 2019 and $8 billion for fiscal year 2020. Question. What will you do to generate to guarantee the VA will receive these funds to ensure veterans receive the medical care they need in a timely manner. Thank you. Well, I would start by saying that we have to uh, continue to work to get rid of what are arbitrary budget caps that were imposed by a process that unfolded a few years back called sequestration. 
And as long as those are imposed, we have these, um, uh, these discussions, and there's uncertainty and um, anxiety, I'm sure. Um, so I believe we have to lift them. I, I really have to say that I find um, some irony, um, then that's Wisconsin nice way of saying it, some irony in the fact that nobody asked how we were going to pay for a tax giveaway to uh, corporate uh, multinational corporations and the top 1%. But then we say, well, we can't cover our commitment on veterans' health until we figure out a way to pay for it. Um, that, to me, is uh, uh, beyond irony. It's, um, uh, it's wrong. And uh, Congress needs to be willing, and not only willing, you need to say if we send service members off to fight in wars, that we stand by our commitment to make sure that they get the highest quality care that they have earned and you have earned. DAV, along with over 30 other organizations, supported passage of the VA Mission Act of 2018. This new law is expected to improve access for veterans by creating integrated networks of VA healthcare systems and community partners while maintaining the VA as the primary provider and coordinator of care. Although VA has always relied on private community care to fill in access gaps, there are still some critics of the VA Mission Act who argue the law would push VA toward privatization. Question, what do you say to those that believe the VA Mission Act will lead to privatization of the VA health care system? Um. So let me, let me just start by uh, saying that I strongly oppose privatization for a number of reasons and wouldn't have supported the um, VA Mission Act had I believed that that was a real uh, threat. Uh, as you noted in the question, uh, or the preface to the question, the VA has long pr relied on um, uh, health care in the community to supplement um, uh, care provided in the VA. But let me just say why I oppose privatization. Number one, because there's an expertise uh, in the VA that you would not find replicated outside the VA um, related to conditions that veterans commonly uh, and uniquely face. Um, and I would hate to ever lose that expertise. You also have a whole workforce, oftentimes veterans themselves, who are so committed to the mission of serving their fellow uh, uh, service members, um, or uh, if they're not veterans themselves, they're just dedicated to that mission. But the third and perhaps most important reason I oppose privatization is because you do, and I listen to you for advice and counsel as well as collaboration on how to do right by veterans in health care. And so uh, because so many organizations like the DAV that are dedicated to making sure that we continue to strengthen and improve the VA uh, supported the Mission Act, it was important that we put in safeguards to prevent um, you know, another administration or another uh, uh, Congress trying to push a political agenda of privatization. And so I worked with the sponsors to add those safeguards um, to make sure uh, that we wouldn't uh, be leading down a path of, of privatization. DAV was instrumental in establishing the VA Comprehensive Caregiver Support Program in 2010, which provides family caregivers of veterans severely injured on or after 9-11 with important caregiver support, such as education, training, health coverage, and a modest stipend. Because of DAV's work on the Mission Act this past year, family caregivers of all severely injured veterans will be able to participate in this program. However, veterans who need family caregivers due to severe illnesses, due to such things as toxic exposure from Agent Orange, 
or burn pits or suffering from the Persian Gulf War illnesses are not eligible to participate in the VA Comprehensive Caregiver Support Program. Question. Will you work to pass legislation to ensure family caregivers of all severely ill and injured veterans are eligible for a VA Comprehensive Caregiver Support Program? Uh, the quick answer is yes. Uh, when a veteran needs assistance from a caregiver, it can be for a reason of injury, and it can also be for a reason of illness. And if it is service-connected, it certainly ought to be uh, treated with equity. Uh, the veteran should be treated with equity, as should the caregiver. Uh, as was noted in um, my introduction, um, although my grandmother was not a veteran, I know something about caregiving. And uh, it was my honor since uh, my grandmother had raised me since I was two months old to be able to be involved in, um, in helping her when she, uh, when she needed it. Um, and recently, after a multi-year effort, I joined forces with um, a colleague, a Republican colleague, Susan Collins of Maine, to introduce and finally pass something called the Raise Family Caregivers Act, recognizing that across this country, uh, loved ones make lots of sacrifice to sacrifices to take care of other loved ones. Uh, while this uh, measure did not apply specifically to veterans, it is a part of a passion that I have to recognize and support the people who do the care. Uh, and I was pleased to join Senator Dick Durbin in 2015 and working with the DAV to introduce the Caregivers Expansion and Improvement Act um, to opening up the VA caregivers program to all eligible veterans, but now we have to expand the definition of who is eligible. Oh, thank you. I sh I'll take a sip. <laughs> the number of women serving on active duty in the Guard and Reserve components of the military continues to increase rapidly. Uh, so do the number of veterans. The total population of women veterans expected to increase at an average rate of almost 18,000 women per year for the next nine years, making the need to ensure sex-specific care and services are available to women when they come to the VA. Question, what would you do to ensure the sex-specific needs of women veterans are addressed appropriately within the Veterans Health Administration? Well, it starts with uh, sponsoring as a co-sponsor the Deborah Sampson Act. Um, this is a, an act that has been introduced um, uh, that would name, uh, well, that would make sure that every VA health facility has a primary care provider that specializes in women's health. It would also add to the budget for facility improvement so that we can address some of the inadequacies of current facilities that were built, presuming that 99.9% .9 of the folks that they uh, would see would be uh, male veterans, obviously this is something that's been changing over years, but some of our facilities um, were not built to accommodate that. And then um, provisions for uh, child care uh, uh, for women veterans um, uh, and better maternity care uh, uh, facilities and options for, um, uh, for veterans. Um, I just want to mention, maybe this is well known in the room, but it was something that I learned when I, it's like, who is Deborah Sampson? Should we be, um, you know, did we name this bill after a, a woman veteran who um, got, uh, uh, you know, had, had trouble accessing care? No, uh, indeed, Deborah Sampson is a woman who disguised herself as a man to join the Continental Army uh, during the American Revolution, 
and she is honored in, uh, in the naming of this particular act. Um, I will also say that in addition to the Deborah Sampson Act, which um, is very specific in terms of um, the improvements that would need to be made, um, there are some other important things that we've been pushing in the VA um, subcommittee of the uh, Appropriations Committee, and um, including uh, being able to get uh, in the recently passed appropriations bill, an additional $10 million above the president's request uh, for um, facilities and gender-specific care um, for the continuing uh, redesign of VA women's health care uh, and the health care delivery system. So um, we're, I'm fighting in committee and subcommittee, too. In September 2018, the DAB released their report, Women Veterans, The Journey Ahead. It spotlights how the expanding role of women in our armed forces is necessitating changes to an array of policies and programs in the Department of Veterans Affairs and other federal agencies. Women are the fastest growing subpopulation of the military and veterans communities, representing more than 15% of active duty military and 10% of the veterans. Yet, despite recent progress, some women veterans continue to face significant barriers accessing health care, and others earn benefits and do not receive proper recognition for their service to this nation. Nevertheless, despite these ongoing challenges, Congress has not had a hearing on female veterans issues since December 2015. Question, do you support calling for a new oversight hearing to discuss these issues, and can we can we have your commitment to help resolve these issues moving forward? Um, absolutely, yes. I I was surprised to learn that like really we haven't had anything focusing on that since um, 2015. It, it was quite shocking to me. Now I know uh, I was referencing the Deborah Sampson Act. Um, the the Senate's uh, VA uh, uh, committee um, often will hold a hearing on four or five pieces of legislation, have four or five witnesses, and so they have held a hearing on that measure that I was just describing, but that's not a hearing, an oversight hearing, that's a legislative hearing. We need to hear from both uh, female veterans who have stories to tell and things that will inform our policy, but also those charged with overseeing uh, these, um, these programs. Um, I, because I sit, as I mentioned before, on the VA subcommittee of, or VA, uh, the sub, appropriation subcommittee on veterans affairs, I am going to ask my chairman and my uh, ranking member of that subcommittee to uh, do to, to have a hearing focusing on that, and uh, that way I'll be able to participate directly rather than uh, having it on the other committee. But um, but I think that that's something that we should be able to uh, push forward. In recent years, there have been a number of alarming proposals calling for reducing veterans' benefit, whether as part of the VA budget <laughs> submission, a CBO or OMB report or another source. For example, the administration's fiscal year 2019 budget request for VA contained a proposal to round down the cost of living adjustment for service-connected compensation and dependency and indemnity compensation. This proposal would have cost veterans $2.83 billion over 10 years. Question. Where do you stand on the issue of scaling back veterans' benefits to reduce government spending? And do we, do we as disabled veterans, have your assurance that you will stand with us to oppose any such proposals in the future? You certainly have my commitment. Uh, I don't believe that we should be attempting to balance the budget on the backs of veterans by clawing back uh, on and and not honoring uh, promises that have been made. 
And so I will fight those, uh, those efforts. Um, and I would just, again, say that it's um, troubling to me that uh, too many of my colleagues in the Congress didn't ask the question how we're going to pay for it when tax breaks were provided to billionaires and massive corporations, but instead are saying, um, how are we going to pay for it when we're talking about uh, earned, um, earned programs? And, and, uh, and particularly the example you give is, it's a perfect example. Okay. Large burn pits have been used throughout the operations in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Africa, uh, in Djibouti specifically, to dispose of nearly all forms of waste. It is estimated that such pits, some nearly as large as 20 acres, are or have been located at every military forward operating base. The burn pit, the burn pit's waste products include, but are limited to, plastics, rubber, chemicals such as paint solvents, petroleum products, munitions, and other unexploded ordinances, wood, waste, medical, and human waste, and incomplete combustion byproducts. Today, thousands of veterans believe their illnesses are due to their exposure to burn pits. But the governor offers the government offers no presumption these diseases are linked to burn pit exposure. The question do you believe that our nation has a responsibility for investigating and compensating veterans for any negative health impacted by burn pit exposure? Yes, I do, and um, I reflect on the sort of history of these issues and challenges. It took years after Vietnam for uh, the government um, and the VA to recognize the link between some of the conditions and illnesses that veterans were coming down with and use of Agent Orange. Um, that's not the only instance in which there's been too long of a time that passed before uh, veterans were either believed um, or uh, that links were uh, recognized by the VA. Um, I remember well, I, I, when I first was elected to the House of Representatives, I had two uh, among my staff, two of them were uh, Gulf War veterans. And I remember one describing his cough and his, um, you know, undiagnosed um, problems. And he had been in Kuwait and he had been uh, not only by burn pits, but I believe, um, you know, the oil wells that were on fire. And I... Uh, it was so long before there was a recognition of a Gulf War syndrome uh, and a unique set of uh, symptoms and, and uh, illnesses that came out of those unique exposures. So um, uh, specifically on, uh, on the effects of burn pits, um, uh, I have taken the lead in the Senate and just helped to get a $5 million uh, VA Center of Excellence uh, set up to study the health effects of uh, exposure to um, whatever comes out of, of burn pits. Medicinal cannabis policy at the state level has shifted significantly in recent years as states have moved to legalize the drug for both medicinal and adult use, which often runs counter to federal marijuana policies. One such policy area is conducting robust, effective medicinal cannabis research. Current policy prevents the Department of Veterans Affairs from conducting comprehensive clinical studies of cannabis to prove medical safety and efficiency for veterans who receive health care from the Department of Veterans Affairs. Question. What is your position on VA conducting research on cannabis, cannabis delivered products, and their delivery system? Uh, well, I am very supportive of that sort of research. Um, for too long, because of particular federal policies, um, we've had 
uh, no ability for the VA or other um, agencies to be able to do this sort of research or even to be able to conduct research uh, to any significant extent with federal funds like the National Institutes of Health, et cetera. So that's problem number one. And um, we face these issues uh, in, when we're in the Appropriations Committee because um, there's often uh, uh, the um, sort of a bar on, on this sort of research that we're trying to overturn. But I wanted to add one other issue, which I find <clears throat> um, very disturbing, and that is that uh, not Wisconsin, but other states now have, uh, as you said in the question, approved uh, uh, medical marijuana for um, uh, well, for medical use and adult use, um, hospitals, VA hospitals in those states um, are in a very unique circumstance that despite the state having taken steps to legalize, um, a VA doctor cannot answer questions that his patient might ask about whether uh, they should seek uh, uh, to use uh, medicinal marijuana and how it might affect their health condition. They're gagged basically from being able to discuss with their patients because of uh, their relationship with the federal government, not the state government. And so we have uh, each year been uh, voting and it's, I'm happy to report, a bipartisan vote these days, um, perhaps in part because of which states have uh, gone forward. Uh, but a bipartisan vote in committee to allow VA doctors to use their medical knowledge and not have to clam up when they're asked by their patients about something that they should be able to discuss with their patients. In May 2017, the administration's fiscal year 2018 budget contained a proposal to eliminate eligibility for total disability based on individual unemployability commonly referred to as IU. For thousands of disabled veterans, it would have terminated existing IU ratings for veterans when they reached the age of 62, as well as cut off any veteran already in receipt of Social Security retirement benefits. DAV and other veteran service organizations in opposition to the proposal reminded the administration that TDIU is not equal to or similar to unemployment insurance, or a retirement program. The administration subsequently backed away from this proposal. However, the threat remains that this proposal, or something like it, could resurface in the future. Yeah. Question, where do you stand on this issue? And do we, as disabled veterans, have your assurances that you will stand with us to oppose any such proposal in the future? Um, so I opposed the administration's attempt to uh, cha make changes to the um, individual uh, unemployability, uh, uh, you know, that provision that they put in their uh, proposal. And I'm glad that it was under the previous uh, VA secretary that they pulled back on that pretty quickly. They heard your voices and our voices to get collectively. Um, but uh, so they pulled it back. We don't see it in their next budget proposal. However, we need to be vigilant. And I just ask you to uh, keep on monitoring the situation because who knows, it's a new VA secretary. Um, we just need to make sure that this doesn't resurface. And I'll join you in that fight if it does. As you may know, veteran service organizations are here to not only provide you the perspective of veterans, but also to guard and protect the benefits and services earned by veterans, including protecting the VA from privatization. Question, would you be willing to work with veteran service organizations on other stakeholders to not only ensure veterans' benefits, services, and health care are safe from privatization, but also work to ensure the VA has all of the resources it needs to provide optimal health care while effectively administering the benefits and services veterans have already earned? Um, 
So hopefully you, hopefully you noted in my opening statement that working with veteran service organizations that represent the collective voice of their members is something that I do all the time. Um, and I know we're not going to make headway on our priorities if we don't both aim to work in a bipartisan manner in the Congress and, uh, and within communities, but also uh, work closely with the folks and, you know, your, your, your volunteers with the DAV, um, but yet you're representing so many voices of others um, by being a part of this, by being a part of the uh, uh, effort to create a legislative agenda, to bring that to Washington, to bring that to Madison. Um, and so uh, I am absolutely willing to work with VSOs and uh, other stakeholders uh, on all of the issues you mentioned. But I think that um, there's going to be some key ones that uh, – you know, we're either making some progress on or we want to make sure that we don't take steps backwards. And that's where I'm going to really call on you to be shoulder-to-shoulder uh, -shoulder with us as we make those, uh, take on those battles. And the uh, final question. H.R. 299, the Blue Water Navy Vietnam Veterans Act of 2018 would reverse an erroneous decision by the Department of Veterans Affairs in 2002 that made thousands of Vietnam veterans, commonly called the Blue Water Navy veteran, ineligible for health care and benefits connected to illnesses causing by exposure to Agent Orange. H.R. 299 passed the House of Representatives in July 2018 by a 382 to 0 vote. It is currently considered, being considered by the Senate Question, do you support expanding presumptive disease to those veterans who served in the waters offshore of Vietnam? I sure do, and I'm an original co-sponsor of the Senate legislation uh, that would do uh, uh, just that to expand the uh, presumption uh, for the deep water, or the blue, deep water, the blue water navy. Uh, the... Um, uh, it makes more sense that we should take up the House pass bill since it passed unanimously and then we don't have to go back and forth and back and forth. And so I'm hopeful that we will do that shortly. And I just have to say, given, you know, when you, when you think about it, there's urgency to this. Um, people who are, uh, have been exposed, uh, to Agent Orange, um, who have, uh, developed illnesses can't wait for a decade for Congress to dither around with this. This is something that has to be done and has to be done with dispatch. Uh, the other thing I would add, um, and again, something that I look forward to working with you on, is um, the presumption extended to more people who were um, involved in nuclear testing or cleanup. Um, I met recently, I'm um, uh, with a group of veterans, small group who just stopped by my office. Um, uh, they had worked on um, the ONAC ATOL. Uh, I'm trying to get the pronunciation. Some of you who may know much better than I do. And almost to a one, uh, they had a cancer history. And the idea that uh, there is no presumption there is just, you know, wrong, just wrong. And so I hope that we can work together on, on both of those uh, through to success. Uh, Ma'am, if you want to go into uh, closing statements then? Well, I will be very brief because I simply want to thank you for this opportunity. I especially want to thank you for being flexible since I was supposed to be here at 8 a.m. And, oh, things... Things were a little messy in Washington yesterday. We voted uh, late into the evening. I missed my flight. So um, I, I really appreciate your, uh, your accommodating me. Um, but I want to recognize not only uh, your role in supporting uh, veterans, uh, but your advocacy role and your role in informing policymakers like myself 
uh, keeping me informed. And uh, when we're working on something together, just sticking side by side until we get the job done. Um, your work really makes a difference. And, um, and, and I'm just appreciative of it. I know there's some caregivers here too, not only spouses of veterans, but, veteran, uh, but also people in that caregiving role. What you do matters also incredibly. Um, so I, I know this is a candidate forum, and I always think it's important to ask. Uh, that One shouldn't forget people like to be asked. So I ask for your vote or collectively your, you know, each of your vote. Um, and uh, I'm not going to say on November 6th because there's opportunities to start early. Uh, and so I, I really appreciate uh, your attention and uh, uh, I ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you.